Well, good morning, everyone. How lovely to see you here today, especially if you've just joined us. It is so lovely to have you with us. You are so welcome here today, particularly if this is your first time with us. Uh, know that we're just so delighted that you've uh, chosen this Sunday morning to be with us. And as always, we just hope that we're a blessing to you. And um, whether you're in Edinburgh for a visit or whether you're here long term, it's just so lovely to have you with us. Let me just welcome those who've joined us online as well. It's lovely to have you with us. My name's Graham. I'm the pastor here of the church. Uh, and it's my delight just to lead us in this service this morning. Um, so we come together from all sorts of different weeks. We come together with all sorts of different thoughts in our minds. But the goal every time that we gather together as a local church is to fix our minds on our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. It's him we're about this morning. Uh, and let me just read to you one verse from the Bible that is one of my just most favourite descriptions of who Jesus is. And let's just allow these words, these truths about who he is, as we come to encounter him this morning, to settle our hearts as we come to worship. So really simply, Isaiah 42. This description of Jesus that Isaiah gives, he will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. And so this Jesus we come to today is not a Jesus with his arms folded as we come to worship him. Here is a Jesus with his arms wide open, ready to bestow on us grace and truth. So we're going to sing some songs uh, and later on we're going to pray. There'll be a kids talk as well. Uh, we're going to hear uh, from uh, one of our members is going to lead us in prayer. We're going to spend some time listening to God's word and then we'll uh, spend some time in it together. But that's the goal this morning, to fix our eyes on this Jesus. So why don't we stand, and I'm just going to hand over to Gary, who's just going to lead us in a time of sung worship uh, together. So let's stand. Sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus As he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, and bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation. cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee set of heaven God's own son to purchase and redeem and raise the very ones who nailed him to that tree. Oh, that rocket cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out. Paid in full by 
the precious blood that my Jesus spilt. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Who the sun sets free, always oh, free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, my name's Peter. I'm the youth pastor here, and I want to invite the kids up. I've got an activity for you to do, so if you could come um, and stand here, that would be super. And just while they're doing that, uh, I'll just say activities this morning. We don't have an official Creation Roots rota today, but uh, Room 3 is available for any parents that want to, to use that uh, today. And the embassy, the older kids, are staying in the service today. But we'll be meeting afterwards for app chat to chat uh, about the sermon. Uh, and that'll be happening through in, in room one, I believe. Okay. So, kids, uh, got an activity for you. 
Okay, I'm looking for a champion. I'm looking for a champion. Okay, now you get different kinds of champion. You get like uh, champion runners, you get champion swimmers. Uh, now we don't have room or the ability to do any of that, but I thought what we could do is we could find a champion stand on one legger. Okay, so if you can get a space, maybe spread out. So you've all got a space. So there's a space over there, so maybe you want to spread out. Make sure you've all got a space. Maybe have a practice. Are you going to go with your left leg? Or are you going to go with your right leg? You've got to decide. Okay, because once you start, then that's it. Okay, and none, none of this standing, you're one foot on the other foot. Okay, I know, I know the tricks. Okay, you've got to have the foot, it's got to be on air. Okay, so choose your foot, and then we'll get ready, and then I'll say go, and we'll look and we'll see. Okay, who can last the longest? Oh, and Beth, if you could grab the microphone, because uh, you're also going to have to be answering some questions as well. I'm going to be asking some questions while we do this. So are you ready to start? Okay, choose your foot and go. Okay, and you're not allowed to hold on to anything. As soon as your foot goes down, then you're right, and we'll see if we can find a champion. Right, so last week, we started a new series. We started a new series. We're in the book of Mark. Okay, we've started in our book of Mark. Uh, does anybody know who was, the, who was the character that we were looking at last week? Does anyone remember? Small oh, no, that was, that was Friday Fun Zone. Oh, yeah, you're mixing up Friday Fun Zone. Okay, a few people are out. That's all right. Uh, that was Friday Fun Zone. We were looking at Zacchaeus. But at Kids Church last week, does anyone remember who was the character that we were looking at? Yep, yeah, over here. Jesus' cousin. And what was he called? Do you remember? John the... Baptist. John the Baptist. Baptist. John the Baptist, that's right. So we were looking at John the Baptist. And what was he doing? He was preparing the way for someone. Who do you think he was preparing the way for? Who was he preparing the way for? Jesus. That's right. John the Baptist was preparing the way for Jesus, and he said that people needed to do something to prepare for Jesus coming. He was saying, Jesus is coming. Okay, God's chosen person is coming. What did people have to do to prepare the way for Jesus? What did people have to do? Anyone remember? What did they have to do to prepare the way for Jesus? Okay, now there's a clue Baptized. Get baptized, exactly. There's a clue in John's name. Okay, he was telling people to get baptized. And what was being baptized about? Why did people need to be baptized? Do you remember? Can you think back to even when, when Joe got baptized here and I was talking about that? Why did people need to get baptized? I forgot. Forgot, okay. So they can wash, it's doing an action of washing away their shit sins. Uh, yeah, it's the action showing us washing away their sins, okay? So people needed to get baptised. There was also something else that they needed to do, and it was kind of to do with being baptised as well, yeah? Do you know? I'll give you a clue. Okay, this is the clue. That's the clue. That's the clue, okay? What did they need to do? They needed to... It's a word that begins with R. R, R, R. They go in this way, and then they turn around and they go in this way, yeah? Repent. Repent. They needed to repent. Stop going their own way and start going their God's way. Now, how many people are still in? Me. Most people are out. We've got three. Three. So I don't know if we're going to find our champion. We might need to continue this upstairs. No. We might need to continue this upstairs. But, so we've still not found our champion, but today we're thinking about a champion. Okay, we're thinking about a champion. I bet you can guess who that champion is. Who's the champion? Shout it out. Jesus! Jesus is the champion that we're going to be thinking about today at Kids Church. Okay, but what you're going to find out is you're going to find out what, um, what showed us that he was the champion. There was a few different things that happened and that he did that shows us he is the true champion. He is God's champion. Okay? Are we still on three people? We're still on three people, right? Well, if you can concentrate, it might get harder, particularly if you have to close your eyes now, because we're going to pray, okay? So let's get ready to pray. You ready? P-R-A-Y. Dear God, thank you for today, and we thank you for Jesus, your true champion. I thank you that you sent him, 
And I pray you'd help us um, as we, when we go upstairs uh, with Kids Church, pray you help the kids to understand how we can know that Jesus was the true champion and what that means for us today. Help us all to be able to put our trust in Jesus and to know that he is uh, the champion who conquered sin and death. Help us to put our trust in him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can stop just now. Go take a seat and we'll head upstairs during the next song. Okay, during the next song. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Um, Let me just take this opportunity in our service to give you a few announcements, things going on in the life of the the church. Let me encourage you to come back tonight at 6.30 for our evening service. We have Andy Constable. Andy's a good friend of ours, one of the pastors down at Nidri Community Church. He's going to be taking us uh, through a section of Philippians about knowing Christ, and that's going to be a great encouragement to us. There's also a, a good chance to hear from Andy. We'll do a little Q&A with him about uh, an update on the work of 20 Schemes. So 20 Schemes, the vision to plant 20 churches in, in some of Scotland's poorest and neediest areas, hearing some of the challenges and some of the encouragement uh, that's going on with that work. So please do come 6.30 tonight. It would be lovely to see you. Zoom prayer meeting's on tomorrow night, 8 o'clock. We've been doing this every Monday over the the past couple of years. And it's such a blessing to us as a church family at the beginning of the week just to spend half an hour on Zoom in prayer, praying for our world, our nation, and praying for our church family and the people in our church family as well. So if you're not in the habit of coming to that, it's the easiest thing to do. Just click on the Zoom link and you're in. Just half an hour praying together. But let me uh, just tell you the benefit of coming to that is enormous. So please do come to that 8 o'clock tomorrow night if you're able. Two more things. Membership class, Wednesday uh, uh, the 12th at 7.30. So that's this Wednesday coming. If you've been coming to Brunsfield for a while, we'd love you to consider becoming a member. If this is your church, if this is your spiritual family, your spiritual home, then we'd love uh, for you to think about becoming a member, just joining what God is doing here. Uh, just pledging yourself uh, to the church family here. This is just a class to hear about what membership is and why you should maybe think about it. No obligation at all. Uh, But that'll just be for an hour on Wednesday evening at 7.30. There'll be a link in the newsletter. Uh, But if you don't get the newsletter, come and speak to me and I'll send you the link uh, separately. And just lastly to say, just a little bit of sad family news for us as a church family. Many of you might have heard this morning that Archie Naismith uh, went to be with the Lord last night um, at his care home at St. Raphael's, just down in the Grange. Uh, Archie Naismith, some of you are very aware this morning, will never have heard of Archie before. You won't know who he is. Uh, For many of us in this church family, Archie was a dear, dear friend and brother, uh, and we're going to miss him so much. And we rejoice that he's with the Lord. He's in a better place. But we recognize the the sting of death, and particularly the the mourning that will be going on amongst the family, Um, So let me just encourage you to be remembering the family in your prayers. We'll be praying for them in just a few seconds' time. Um, Just to surround them just now with with our love as a church family, to encourage them, just to cry with them and weep with them and pray with them. Um, But let me just say, Archie Naismith, one of the godliest men I think I've ever met. So why don't we just take a few moments now. I'll compose myself. (laughs) Why don't we just be a few moments in silence, we'll gather our thoughts, let's just offer our own individual prayers for the family, and then we'll pray together specifically for them. So why don't we just do that just now, just at this point in our service. So the words of Psalm 92, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no wickedness in him. And so, Father, we just thank you this morning for a life well lived. We thank you for our dear brother and the fact that he knew you and he loved you. And right to the end of his life, he was running the race for the glory of Jesus. 
Father, much as we rejoice that he is now with you, Father, we recognize the sting of death. And we, we pray maybe particularly, Father, for the, the family today, the Naismith family. Lord, in particular, we would just pray for Ian and for Alice and for Dorothy and for Caroline. And Lord, we pray for their families as well. Lord, that you would draw near to them at this moment. Father, you would bring assurance and comfort. Lord, would you surround them with your people at this time who can encourage and just show how much you have been at work in our midst. And so, Father, we just pray at this point in our service for the Naismith family and all those as well, Lord, the friends who will miss Archie so dearly. And so, Father, may his legacy, may the legacy of a life lived for the glory of Jesus. May the ripples of that just spread out amongst us and encourage us to keep on going. So Father, we thank you for your great love for us as a church family. We thank you for your grace. And so Father, we pray that you would be with each of us now. And we pray these things in Jesus' worthy and in his precious name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing again, and um, boys and girls, this is your cue to go off to Kids Church. Uh, after that, John is going to come as and lead us in a time of, of uh, wider prayer, and then Stuart and Rebecca are going to come and bring us our reading, and then we'll come back for uh, the sermon. But why don't we stand, and let's declare the praises of our holy God. commands all the hosts of heaven Who else can make every knee bow down Who else can whisper and darkness trembles Only our holy God What other beauty demands such praises what other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only our holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only Christ. Sing holy forever, a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. What other glory consumes like fire? What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? Rescue me from my failing Who else would offer his only son Who else invites me to call him father Only our holy God Yes, it's only our holy God Come the world. 
worship the holy God. Come and worship the holy Good morning, everyone. And at this point in the service, we're going to spend some further time in prayer together. We'll pray for the needs of the fellowship, and let's continue very much to pray for all of the Naismith family at this time. We'll remember, too, the work of UCCF, and uh, I think it's good for us also at the start of this new year uh, to look back with thanksgiving and to look forward and commit all our ways to the Lord. I'll just read a few verses from Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 21. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His, mercy, his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, at the beginning of this, another new year, how good it is for us to recall your steadfast love and faithfulness. And to remember that your mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. And as we fix our eyes upon you this morning, Lord, by faith, the one true and living God, we know that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we do have hope and that we have a bright future ahead of us, a future that is as sure and certain as the promises of God. We thank you, our Father, for your dear Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And help us ever to have our eyes fixed upon him, remembering what he has done for us. All that he has suffered going to Calvary's cross and paying the price in full for our redemption. The psalmist could say with confidence, and so can we, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so, dear Lord, at this perhaps rather low time of year for many of us, after Christmas and all of the celebrations, we pray that you will cause us to remember your faithfulness and give us an assurance of your continued goodness and mercy. Our Father, we do give you thanks for your faithfulness to us over the past year, we regret that we have failed you so often. We have sinned and we do sin. But Lord, we thank you that with you there is forgiveness. And even now in the silence of the service, we can bring to you our prayers of repentance, confessing our sins and taking you at your word. For you have said, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, we pray that you will lead us on in your way, in the way of holiness, and that we may serve you and worship you faithfully. Lord, we thank you for every answer to prayer over the past year, and for every blessing, and we look forward to the year ahead. I would ask that this will be a fruitful year. We pray that as a fellowship of your people, we may grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and that we may be careful to devote ourselves to prayer, praying for each other, and for all the outreach and the ministry plans of the coming months in your will. We pray particularly that you will bless and guide and direct our leaders, Pastor Graham and Alistair, Peter and Ian, Archie, Danny and Keita, all the elders of the church and the ministry leaders, Give them your help, give them unity and your guidance for all that they do for you and for all that they do for us as they serve you here at Brunsfield. And our Father, we bring to you the needs of the fellowship at this time and very much 
praying for all of the Naismith family, uh, for those of, of us who have known Archie for many years, uh, we think of him with great affection as our dear brother in Christ, and we do mourn at this time. We ask that you will comfort us and comfort all of the family. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you are indeed the God of all comfort. And we pray especially for all the Naismith family in the days that lie ahead and all that they have to do. Lord, help them, we pray. We want to bring to you also, Lord, those who are in hospital just now. Uh, we thank you for news of good progress and pray for Audrey, Ruth and Robert. Ask you'll have your healing hand upon them and you'll encourage them in their faith in you in these days. And may they know that many in the church are praying for them. We pray for all in the church who are in particular need of prayer at this time for many different reasons. And Lord, while we don't know all the circumstances, we can pray. And we thank you that you know all about us and that you're able to help us. In fact, you've promised your people that as we come boldly to the throne of grace in prayer, you will give us grace and mercy to help in time of need. Well-timed help. Help when we need it most. And help that no one else can give. So, Lord, help us to trust in you. We pray to our Father for the ongoing work of UCCF and bring to you the forthcoming mission weeks plans for the end of the month. We pray that the gospel will be clearly and faithfully presented and that it will be those who will receive the message and come to faith in Christ. We pray especially for the 29 students we heard about at the prayer meeting, uh, those 29 who have responded uh, to what they've heard and asked for a Bible and for more information. Lord, we pray for them and for their salvation. And so now, our Father, as we continue in the service of worship, we pray that you will bless every part of the service. Bless Pastor Graham as he brings your word to us. Bless our times of praise and worship and the communion towards the end of the service. We ask that as we go out from here, uh, we may know that it's been good for us to be here. For not only have we met with one another, but we have met with you. We have met with God. And may we continue in prayer and in praise and in worship and live our lives in a way that is honouring to you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake and for his glory. Amen. Good morning, my name is Rebecca and this is my husband Stuart um, and we're members of the church here. I'm going to read this morning from Ezra and Haggai. First of all, I'm going to read from Ezra chapter 4 verses 1 to 24. In the Pew Bibles it's 475. Okay, so chapter 4, verse 1. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you build, because like you, we seek your God and we've been sacrificing to him since the time of Eshadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the family of Israel answered, you have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord. The God of Israel, as King of Cyrus, uh, the King of Persia, commanded us. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials working to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, King of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, King of Persia. At the beginning of the reign of Xerxes, they lodged an accusation against the people of Judah and Jerusalem. And in the days of Xerxes, king of Persia, Bishlam, Mithridath, 
Tabil and the rest of his associates wrote a letter to Artaxerxes. The letter was written in Aramaic strict and in the Aramaic language. Reham, the commanding officer, and Shimshai, the secretary, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, as follows. Reham, the commanding officer, and Shimshai, the secretary, together with the rest of their associates, the judges, officials, and administrators over the people from Persia, Uruk and Babylon, the Elamites of Susa, and the other people whom great and honorable Ashur Banipal, deported and settled in the city of Samaria and elsewhere in Trans-Euphrates. This is a copy of the letter they sent to him, to King Xerxes, from your servants, the men of Trans-Euphrates. The king should know that the people who come up to us from you have gone to Jerusalem and are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are restoring the walls and repairing the foundations. Furthermore, the king should know that if this city is built and its walls are restored, no more taxes, tribute or duty will be paid and eventually the royal revenues will suffer. Now, since we are under obligation to the palace and it is not proper for us to see the king dishonored, we are sending this message to inform the king so that a search may be made in the archives of your predecessors. In these records, you will find that this city is a rebellious city, troublesome to kings and provinces, a place with a long history of sedation. This is why this city was destroyed. We inform the king that if this city is built and its walls are restored, you will be left with nothing in Trans-Euphrates. The king sent this reply to Rehum, the commanding officer, Shimshai, the secretary, and the rest of their associates living in Samaria and elsewhere in Trans-Euphrates. Greetings. The letter you sent us has been read and translated in my presence. I issued an order and a search was made. And it was found that this city has a long history of revolt against kings and has been a place of rebellion and sedition. Jerusalem had, a par had powerful kings ruling over the whole Trans-Euphrates and taxes, tribute and duty were paid to them. Now issue an order to these men to stop work so that this city will not be rebuilt until I so order. Be careful not to neglect this matter. Why let this threat grow to deter to the detriment of the royal interests. As soon as the copy of the letter of King Xerxes was read to Rehum and Sh Shimshai, the secretary, and their associates, they went immediately to the Jews in Jerusalem and compelled them by force to stop. Thus the work on the house of in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Uh, so the second reading that we'll be uh, going through together is from Haggai, and it's from chapter 1, verse 1 to 11. Uh, if you're using the Pew Bibles, it's on page 948. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the, wood, the, sorry, then the word of the Lord uh, came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and on the mountains, on the grain, the new wine and the olive oil and everything else the ground produces, the people and the livestock and all the labour of your lands, of your hands. So yeah, I'm just going to pray now um, for Graham before he comes to speak to us. So 
Lord, we just want to thank you for the privilege of your word that we have. Lord, thank you that we have it here in front of us and that we can read it together. And Lord, that through that we can know you. I just pray for for Graham as he comes up to uh, share your word with us, that you would help him and guide him and guide his words. Lord, we pray that he would faithfully uh, exposit your truth here from your word. Lord, we pray that anything that would come from him that isn't of you, you would throw away. Lord, we pray that it would just go in one ear and out of the other. Lord, we pray for us to have open ears and listening hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would help us with full attentiveness to, to hear what is to be said and to rejoice in who you are and what you've done. Amen. Okay, folks, with Haggai open in front of you, and if you're struggling to find it, uh, we inside tip is find the first book of the New Testament called Matthew and then skip back three wee ones and you'll, you'll hit Haggai. Um, let me tell you a conversation I had recently. Uh, my oldest daughter came home from school and asked her that question, that annoying question that parents always ask. Uh, and if you're a parent here, you've probably done it. And let me tell you from experience, I've subsequently realized there's better questions to ask that provide better inroads into a conversation. So I asked her on this occasion, I said, how was school today? And what came back from her wasn't so much an answer, it was just a noise. Okay, she just went, meh. Here's what I want you to do. Turn to your neighbour for 10 seconds, have a go at translating meh into English. Okay, go for it. Okay, 10 seconds. Here's what I took from me. I took from it, I'm really not all that fussed. Say something like that. Kind of happened, went through the motions. And let's not pretend we don't do that as adults as well. When some of you have heard you do it when you talk about work, it was a bit meh. A bit meh. But here's the thing, as we get into Haggai this morning, we're going to be in this for the month of January, thinking about this big challenge that this book presents us. It's maybe a book that you've never thought about before. The generation of God's people that Haggai's addressing, he's an Old Testament prophet, could well be nicknamed the meh generation. Because the problem in Haggai is not so much apostasy. They've not abandoned the faith. They've not thrown it out. The problem is not apostasy. The problem is just apathy. They're just not really all that fussed about the Lord. They've just grown a bit meh towards him and his, his ways. Now, let me ask you as you start this, as we start this, if I was to ask you honestly in your heart of hearts how you would describe your current view of the God of the Bible, would it be meh? Right? The fire in your belly that maybe once was there for Jesus has gone cold. The zeal to serve him with your life, to give it your all, isn't quite what it used to be. Let me just say, if that's you here today, then Haggai's the book for you. And these are... Um, Always big questions to ask about our lives, isn't it? That my biggest fear for my life, dear brothers and sisters, is that I'm just going to go a bit meh, right? In life, in ministry, just go a bit lukewarm in my love for Jesus. And this book prompts us to, to have a, take in the panorama of who he is. Now, a great question to ask of this book is, how did this generation of God's people get to this Place. And these are always wonderful opportunities to grasp the fact that when it comes to the God of the Bible, as we think about the background to this letter, we're not dealing in mythology. We're not dealing in mythology. We are dealing and diving into history. And maybe that's a new concept for you this morning. You had the Bible up there with kind of Aesop's fables and the little book of Chinese proverbs. Let me ask you lovingly, have you read it? Have you read it? Maybe you're watching this and you've never thought about the claims of Christianity. Have you read it? 
Would you like to read it? I'm game if you are. Would you like to read it? How do we get to know the God of the Bible? We listen to his voice as he speaks to us. If you're a Christian here today, let me ask you, have you got plans to read the Bible this year? It's always what they say, isn't it? Fail to plan, you'll plan to fail. Do we know the story? It was French philosopher Emile Calais who having asked some big questions of his atheistic worldviews, he sat in the trenches during World War I and thought, what is life all about? A friend gave him a Bible and his return to France, and he said of it, this at last was a book that would understand me. And that's the claim that God would make in his word. Why? Because the God of the Bible, our creator, is the God of history. He is the God of history. And the Babylonians are the world's superpower in 600 B.C., it's kind of roughly where we are. And as part of their territorial expansion program in the year 586, they conquer Jerusalem in the south. And what happens is they gradually carry away God's people to Babylon. And just short of 50 years later, I mean, this really is like a great big game of risk. Another superpower emerges on the world stage called Persia. And the Persians defeat the Babylonians and they take over everything that belongs to them, including the exiles from Judah who happen to find themselves away from their homeland in Babylon. And the Persians have a different tactic to the Babylonians. The Babylonians take and try and convert. What the Persians do is they send back so that the people that they send back will think favorably of them. And so what happens under the orders and support of King Cyrus of Persia, the exiles from Judah are allowed to return to their homeland. So you imagine they make their way back. Zerubbabel, you read about them in verse 1, he leads the first wave of God's people to come back home. But what the Bible is explicitly clear on is that these things didn't happen to God's people because they were the unfortunate victims of power politics. These things happened because God made them happen, right? The exile happened not because the Babylonians are in control, but because standing above it all is a God who is punishing his people for their disobedience and flagrant sin against him. And just like Adam and Eve were, they have to be banished from the promised land. God would not be faithful. He would not be holy if he allowed them to stay. And the people returned to the land, not because Cyrus was a decent bloke, but the people returned to the land because this God is kind, this God is gracious, and this God has purposes to fulfill, plans to bring blessing to the nations of the world, and he's going to do it through this people. And so God's people, to much fanfare and rejoicing, they begin to build the temple again in Jerusalem in 536 BC. And you can read about that in Ezra chapter four. But the thing is, 16 years after that initial bit of enthusiasm, Project Temple 2.0 has completely fizzled out. The people have just lost the spark for the Lord. They've lost the dream for the project. And what God does, because he's gracious, because he is good, because he is loving, he raises up the prophet Haggai to be his messenger. And God's purpose through Haggai is to breathe new life into his people's hearts through a mixture of challenge and encouragement and get them building the temple again. And so you want to tap into Haggai chapter one this morning. Here's what God knows his people are saying. Verse two of chapter one. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not come to rebuild the Lord's house. And you might ask, why is God getting so animated about a building? Why does he care so much about some bricks and mortar? The answer is because of what the, is because of what the temple represents. The temple is about God's presence. This God, despite of who we are, should have said the Israelite, he, he longs to dwell with us. He lives slap bang in the middle of our presence. It's an incredible thing. The God who created all things, he looked on us not because we were good. He looked on us because he's gracious and he lives with us. All the gods of the world live up there. They live out there. Our God lives in the middle of us. And the temple is about God's peace. This is where 
The sacrifice has happened. This is the place where you would go to know that your sins against a holy God have been dealt with. You want to be right with him? You want to be right with him? Your Old Testament Israelite, you've got to go to the temple. You've been given of your sin, and the temple is about God's promises. In other words, this building points beyond itself to a time when the peoples of the world are going to come in and see how good this God is, and the whole earth will one day be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is about way more than a building. That's why we've called the series More Than a Building. And let me try and distill that into really one really simple, accessible truth for us. In Haggai, it's almost as if God is laying his heart on the line and saying to his people, my heart's desire is that you would come to a point where the number one reason that you exist, the greatest longing in your heart is to know me and enjoy me forever. And so that's the question that, God would ask us this morning, this is all about priorities. This is all about what you and I most long for in our hearts. And this is why it's such a brilliant book to study at the outset of this year when we sit down and we think about the things that our lives are going to be about this year. Are they going to be about the Lord? Are they going to be about serving him? Are they going to be about knowing him? Are they going to be about other things? And so in the time remaining, I just want us to focus on two things in these first 11 verses of Haggai chapter 1. Right, two things. What can we say about these people? What what we can say is that they've lost the spring in their spiritual step. They've just gone a bit flat. And there's two reasons why they've gone a bit flat. And just notice as we go through these just how close to the bone and relevant these things are for us. The first reason is in the text. And the reason is it's just really simpler to settle down. All right, know that in your life. Really just simpler to settle down. Now, any good estate agent will tell you that a good investment strategy is to find the most expensive street and to buy on it the cheapest house. All right, buy the doer up, that's what they say. Well, on Jerusalem Main Street, the cheapest house going is the temple. Have a look at what God says at verse three. Here's the challenge. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? So it's not like these people aren't busy, right? They're really busy, really busy. Verse nine, God knows that they're busy. Verse nine, you are busy with your own houses. There's nothing wrong with being busy. It's God's people were called to be productive But what's happened is that they've confused primary and secondary things, right? Primary things have become secondary things. Secondary things have become primary things. How true is that in the Christian life? This is a challenge to keep the main thing the main thing. They are prioritizing paneled houses. They are prioritizing their own little DIY projects, right? The extension on the side, going up to the attic, out into the garden, They're pursuing their own agendas for bigger and better over and above God's purposes. You know, think about it, guys. Think about my conversations over the holiday there and how much of them centered around our home, our next move, the next project, the next promotion at work. Do you know these kind of things? I was challenged over those conversations, thinking to myself, what would somebody listening in on that Shanksy, what would they conclude is the thing that drives your life from what you've said in that conversation? What gets you going? What gets you up out of bed in the morning? What would they derive from that conversation? As you go into work tomorrow, as you go on the school run, as you go to school, what is it as people look in at us that that they would deduce to the things that make us tick? It's easier to settle down. And reason two, I think, is behind the text. And it's just safer to blend in. Heard it in Ezra chapter 4, when the people started rebuilding, <clears throat> there came a wave of opposition from their neighbors. Because for them to, to get back in the land, and remember, it's not just them, there's, there's people from the, all over the nations round about in there. For them to start building the temple, for them to erect a structure right in the middle, is to declare to the world that our God is the true God, and all the other gods that you worship are pretenders. So you can imagine the people of the world looking in at that thinking, we're not having that. 
Not for that. We really don't like what you guys stand for. And that can be hugely discouraging to know that in your own life. Discouraging when people say, I don't want anything to do with what you stand for. You know, I was taking the kids yesterday to the rope park at Craig Miller, telling a lady I met there what I did for a job, and her face dropped. Not interested. It's discouraging, isn't it, when people, people say that? And after a while, that discouragement can lead to despondency, and after a while, it can just leave us with the feeling that it's just easier to duck a conversation. Yeah? And I find it as a parent not to try and constructively try and speak to the school lovingly about why they're asking my children to wear purple to celebrate Pride Day, right? It just becomes easier to duck that conversation. Not because I want to do anything other than love and welcome and respect every human being who's made in God's image and hear me right clear on that. But because as a Christian, I just cannot affirm any any lifestyle that would run contrary to what the Bible teaches. I just can't do that in good conscience. But after a while, it just becomes easier to duck a conversation. It becomes easier to avoid a certain question. When people ask you what you did at the weekend, how easy is it just to say that you spent time with friends? And all of a sudden, you see how this becomes really close to the bone. It's just simpler to settle down and it's just safer to blend in. And you bring those two things together. Here's what happened. Here's what's happened in the background here to these people. The, the, the idol of comfort. We just want a comfortable life. Right? You're not doing away with God. We just want a comfortable life has taken the throne in these people's lives. And they've just lost a sense of the buzz for who the Lord is. But what we can say secondly about this God is that he won't settle for second place. For here's the question God asks, verse five and seven. He says, give careful thought to your ways. He says, stop and think about how you're living and stop and think and consider how it's going. All right, God knows that these people are throwing, what these people are throwing themselves into. You get a list there. Uh, From verse 5 and from verse 7. Planting, harvesting, eating, clothing, earning. These are busy people. And particularly if you consider Haggai, because of the dating, he begins to speak at the harvest season when the people would begin to think that they might see results from these things, but they're not. God says, consider your ways. What's it telling you? I love that image you get there of of putting money in a purse with holes in it. (laughs) That constant cycle of money coming in and going out again and it didn't even hit your bank account you know that feeling it just comes and it goes I've never seen it what's going on what, what? that's what he's saying these things that you're plowing yourselves into do you see just how fragile and unsteady it all is I read a fascinating quote from Jim Carrey recently Hollywood actor he said I don't blow money I don't have tons of houses I know things can go away I've already had that experience And it's true, isn't it? The things of our lives that we so often pursue are here today and often gone tomorrow. And God says, where is this getting you? What is it telling you? But more than that, God says, and this is is difficult for us to hear, but this is true when you think about it. God says, I brought these things to pass. Right? Verse 9, what you brought home, I blew away. Verse 11, I called for a drought on the fields. And if the people were on the ball, they'd remember that these are the covenant curses that God said he would bring in them for their disobedience. What does this signify? It signifies that things aren't good between them and the Lord. Now, we need to understand that we live at a different time in history from these people when Jesus has taken the covenant curses that we deserve on himself on the cross. Okay, he has died for the curses and punishment that I deserved. So this is not a straight line application for us today. But the heart of God in this remains the same. The love of God in this remains the same. What does he want? He wants his people to wake up and remember who he is. Remember who he is. Seven times in these verses, God's covenant name, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that was a mouthful. The Lord is used. Do you see it? Seven times, 34 times in these three, sorry, these two chapters, 
God says, I am the Lord, right? I am the God who has loved you with an everlasting love. Remember that. I am a God who has fully committed myself to you in love and to my plans. I am the Lord. Don't forget that. I am the Lord, not changed. You've gone and come back. I've not changed. And he is the Lord Almighty. He's the God of angel armies. That's what that means. God wants his people to know in a world of scary opposition that he's always in control. That he's always bigger. That he's always better. And why are they to build the house? See that magic word beginning with P at verse 8. God says that I may take pleasure in it. This God is a jealous God. He's not jealous of his people, right? That's us. We get jealous of things all the time in my heart. It's our twisted hearts. I see someone having a better time than me on Facebook. I want it. That's my jealous heart. We get jealous of things. But this God is jealous for his people. And there's a world of difference between being jealous of something and being jealous for something. There's a world of difference between him and us. He wants the sole affection of his people's hearts. He wants the people, his people, to find their all satisfaction in him. And so this God says, I will not settle for second place. And fast forward to Mark's gospel in the New Testament, and we see Jesus saying the exact same thing. So in Mark chapter 10, this rich young man comes to Jesus with a burning question. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? For all intents and purposes, as a reader, you read it and you think, this guy has it sorted. This is the guy that we would look at and think, we want to be like him. And Jesus gives him the commandments, do not steal, do not murder, honor your father and mother. And it's almost as this guy goes, tick, 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 tick. Done it all. I've kept them. And I love it, you read Mark 10, and it it comes across as you read it, Jesus could have quite easily left the conversation there and said, that's great, mate, off you go. But no, he didn't leave it there. Because Jesus loves us too much for us to make him second place. Mark lets us know that Jesus, and notice this word in the text, you've got to notice it, okay? Jesus looked at him, and what did he do? He loved him. And that's why the conversation kept going. And that's why Jesus asked a searching question of this man's heart, because he loved him. And that's why God would ask it of us this morning, as he searches our hearts through his words. Doesn't do it to out us. He does it because he loves us. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus isn't simply after this man's surface obedience. He longs to have first place in this man's life because true life will only be found in making Jesus king, letting him have the driving seat and allowing him to reshape and reform our minds. So I was thinking about this over the holidays. Remember driving out and I'm driving behind somebody with L plates on. I remember doing that. Maybe some of you are doing it. Maybe some of you will do it. Remember doing it. What is it they made us do before we start our test? Just put the L plates on, saying to the world, I'm still learning. Let me just say the Christians that have made the biggest impact on me over my Christian life are the people I could look at and I could say, at whatever age they are, they've never stopped learning. They've never stopped learning Jesus. And it's almost as if Jesus at this point, as this man comes to him and says, what will it take for me to follow you? He is saying that you need to put an L plate on your life And you need as a disciple to be all about learning me for life. To be a disciple is to learn Jesus. Learn Jesus. And the thing is, when you come to Jesus, and I love this in the Gospels, people flock to him. Why? Because in him, they don't find someone with arms folded. They find somebody with arms open wide who welcomes them in and says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. And that's the Jesus who we meet in the Gospels. And that's why Jesus goes after the idol in this man's heart. And he says, go and sell everything that you have and come follow me. Because that's the idol in this man's heart. And Jesus loves him too much to let him settle for that. But the decision's in his core. And it turns out he loves money more than Jesus. And Mark tells us that he goes away with his face sad. 
But let me just ask you, Jesus would ask us through his word, what would define success for you this year? If you're thinking about what's on the throne of your life, what would, what if it didn't happen this year would leave you feeling gutted? The grades at school, you need to get into that college or uni, getting into that friendship group that you've been trying to tap into, get your foot in the door for years. What about that holiday that it might happen or might not happen, that time off? What about that partnership, promotion at work? Whatever it is, Jesus would say, because he loves us, he would say, is following me your greatest priority? Is following me your greatest priority? The thing is, we don't go to a temple anymore. We go to Jesus. As New Testament believers, the true meeting place between God and man. And so the question becomes, are we prioritizing knowing him? Are we investing what we have in the spread of the gospel? Do we love and serve and care for the people that are so dear to Jesus' heart? Have we got a heart for the peoples of this world who do not know this Jesus because life is to be found in him? As we close, I had something to close with and I just in the drive up, I thought I'd change it in light of this morning. Let me just tell you about a man who had his priorities right. So three years ago, I remember speaking to Archie at an evening service and he sat right there. And I asked him, Archie, how can I pray for you this week? And let me just say, if we want to change the spiritual temperature amongst us, that's a great question to ask. How can I pray for you this week? So I asked him the question and he sat there for about 10 seconds just in silence. And I could see that he was staring, just thinking about it. And the guy at that point in his life was not short of physical ailments. Could have said anything. Could have said hip. Could have said all sorts of things. Physical stuff. He could have also said, pray for my family. Pray for my family. Pray for their interests. Pray for what's going on in their lives. Because you know the Naismith family. It's big, right? Could have said family. But do you know what he said? He said, would you pray for my walk with Jesus? And to my dying day, that will stay with me as a man who had his priorities right. So the question that comes from Haggai chapter 1 and the question that's going to come at us through this book, Jesus says, am I number one? Am I number one? Do you see that I love you to ask you enough? Am I your greatest priority? So friends, let's just pause for a moment just before I pray. And let's just allow God to do his work by his spirit through his words in our lives as we respond to this challenge this morning. Let's pause for a moment and then we'll pray. So Heavenly Father, we ask that by your spirit, you would show us this morning the areas where we need to change. Thank you that you love us so incredibly much that you would take the time to send your son Jesus in pursuit of us, to search us out, to save us, to rescue us, to reconcile us to yourself. And you are committed to forming us more than to the likeness of him. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us this year to prioritize above all the other things that are important and that we need to think about. Would they all fall into place under the number one priority of seeking first the kingdom of God and your righteousness? And we thank you that you're a God who is committed to lovingly meeting all of our needs in Jesus. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Well, friends, we are going to close our service. And after the service, uh, after we've closed, we'll take communion together. Uh, But let me just take this opportunity to say thank you to those who've joined us online. And why don't we just stand together? And it's a wonderful song as we respond to this this morning. Uh, And let's sing this song, Jesus, thank you. And then we'll come back together for a short time of communion.
mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend The agonies of Calvary You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your Son You drank the bitter cup reserved for me blood has washed away my sin Jesus thank you the Father's right completely satisfied Jesus thank you once your enemy now seated at your table Jesus Your perfect sacrifice I've been brought near Your enemy you made your friend I'm Pouring out the riches of your glorious grace Your mercy and your kindness know no end Your blood Washed away my sin, Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. Satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once you're enemy. 